world news tonight. Escalating violence. Rioters assault the home of Paris sub mayor as violence in France continues into the fifth night. Under fire. Yet more military raids conducted by Israel on the West Bank have militant groups reeling from impact. Growing closer. The US Treasury chief is set to visit China in an effort to continue the momentum of building ties between the global superpowers. Celebrating Canada Day. Vancouver's famous dancing ferry is put on a show fit for a nation. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. A good evening and you are watching World News this morning. We start off tonight with updates on the continuing violence in France as attackers try to set fire to the home of suburban Paris mayor's home overnight and fired rockets at the officials fleeing wife and children. The incident has caused widespread shock and is being treated as an attempted murder. Prime Minister Elizabeth Bourne described it as intolerable. This is Laine Les Roses, a town of 30,000 people just south of Paris. After several nights of violent riots, which saw shatter the glass doors of City Hall in an attempt to set fire to its interior, Mayor Vincent Jambrun set up a barricaded perimeter topped by barbed wire. That barrier was put to the test Friday night, tried once again to break in before police arrived. I was in my office on the second floor there. In all my 39 years here in Les Roses, I've never been so afraid as I was last night. But worse was to come. At 1.30 a.m. Sunday morning, as the mayor once again spent the night inside City Hall, attackers drove a car through the gate of his family home, setting fire to it as they tried to break down the door. Asleep inside were his wife and two children who suffered injuries as they fled in terror over their garden wall. In a statement, Jean Brun says his determination to serve the republic is stronger than ever. This week's riots have seen a number of French mayors targeted, this one in San Juan, north of Paris, deciding to confront as mortar fireworks exploded around him. Moving on to updates on the international outrage of Quran burnings as Sweden's government condemned the burning of a Quran outside Stockholm's May Mosque, calling it an Islamophobic act, after an international Islamic body called for measures to avoid future burnings. A Quran burning outside the main mosque in Stockholm has drawn international condemnation. Four days after the event, the Swedish government issued a foreign office statement on Sunday. The Swedish government fully understands that the Islamophobic acts committed by individuals at demonstrations in Sweden can be offensive to Muslims. We strongly condemn these acts, which in no way reflect the view of the Swedish government. The 57-state Organization of Islamic Cooperation held an emergency meeting on Sunday, where the Secretary-General called on the international community to prohibit the promotion of religious hatred. We we need to send a clear message that acts of desecration of the noble Quran and insults to our Prophet Muhammad are not mere ordinary Islamophobia incidents. After Iraqi refugee Salwan Momika applied for police permission to burn the holy book outside a mosque, Stockholm's police granted the request on grounds that what he wanted to do was not illegal. The decision has sparked protests at home and across the world, including in Pakistan. I believe that by supporting such an act, the Swedish government has hurt religious sentiments of Muslims around the world. I demand the Pakistani government cease diplomatic relations with Sweden. Further, Iraq, Kuwait, the UAE and Morocco have summoned their ambassadors in protest, with Iran announcing they were delaying on sending their new ambassador to Sweden. One bridge Sweden cannot afford to burn is with Turkey one of only two NATO allies yet to approve their membership. Stockholm hopes to receive a green light from Ankara in the next two weeks. Erdogan spoke in vehement terms on Friday, saying those who allow such actions would not be able to achieve their goals. Israel's military said that it hit a command center for militant fighters in the West Bank city of Jenin in a strike early today that local residents said killed at least one person and involved a missile fired from the air. 
The Israeli military said it struck a joint operations center which served as a command center for fighters from the Jenin Brigades, an armed unit comprised of fighters from different militant groups. The military said the target functioned as an advance observation and reconnaissance center and a weapons and explosive site as well as a coordination and communications hub for the militant fighters. It provided an aerial photograph showing what it said was the target which indicated the building hit was located near two schools and a medical center. Israeli forces have conducted regular raids in Jenin in the northern West Bank, where Palestinian militant groups including Hamas and Islamic Jihad have hundreds of armed fighters. Only days before last month's drone strike, the army used helicopter gunships to help extract troops and vehicles from a raid on the city, after fighters used explosives against a force sent in to arrest two militant suspects. At least two people were killed and dozens were wounded in a mass shooting in southeast Baltimore. Authorities reported that the shooting happened at a block party in the city's Brooklyn neighborhood. At least two people were killed and 28 injured, including about a dozen children, in a mass shooting in Baltimore early Sunday morning. And, according to police, the shooters are still at large. In what Maryland authorities called insanity, the shooting took place after a neighborhood party and left an 18-year-old woman and 20-year-old man dead. Maryland Senate President Bill Ferguson. This is a societal problem that we're dealing with, a mass shooting where a disagreement turns into 28 people shot. This is insanity. This cannot, cannot be the society that we are expected to live in. We have to do better. Police said they're searching for multiple suspects and are urging the community to come forward with any information or videos. They also said the injured range from 13 to 32 years old and that nine people were still hospitalized with wounds from gunfire as of Sunday afternoon, including a few in critical condition. The tragedy rattled the city of Baltimore, 40 miles north of Washington, D.C., at the start of the 4th of July holiday weekend. That's when Americans typically gather for parades, barbecues and fireworks. According to local media, the shooting took place shortly after midnight at a block party in the Brooklyn Homes neighborhood with hundreds of people attending. The Russian mercenary leader Yevgeny Prigozhin's social media outlet, which was used to form and shape the public opinion, has now been disbanded. Meanwhile, the United Nations has announced it has added the Russian armed forces to a global list of shame for attackers on schools and hospitals and for killing of children. Russian news outlets are reporting that a social media troll factory owned by Yevgeny Prigozhin, the Russian mercenary leader, used to allegedly influence public opinion in the United States and other countries, has been disbanded following the stunning mutiny by Prigozhin and his Wagner Group fighters in Russia last month. The Commerçant, a Russian newspaper, is also reporting that the government's communications watchdog is blocking media outlets linked to Prigozhin without elaborating. On Saturday, cameras spotted Wagner logos being removed from its corporate offices in St. Petersburg. The building was raided by authorities during the mutiny. It was opened only last year and dubbed a military technology center. The U.S. government and European Union have long accused Prigozhin of funding an organization known as the Internet Research Agency, which Washington says is a troll farm that tried to meddle in the 2016 presidential election. Prigozhin himself has previously admitted to interfering in U.S. elections and that he founded and financed the organization, although the Kremlin has always denied any interference. Separately, a media holding group owned by Prigozhin is said to have been shut down, according to the director of one of the news sites under its umbrella. It gave no reason for the move. The group, called Patriot Media, had a strong nationalist and pro-Kremlin stance it also provided positive coverage of Prigozhin and his mercenaries. We'll be back with more world news of this short commercial break. Welcome back. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen will make an official visit to Beijing. The second top U.S. official was sent to the number two economy in the world in a matter of weeks in an ongoing effort by President Joe Biden to stabilize relations. 
The U.S. is sending its second top official to China in a matter of weeks, with Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen traveling to Beijing on Thursday. A senior Treasury official said Sunday that Yellen will meet with senior Chinese officials on a broad range of issues. Those include U.S. concerns about the impact of China's new anti-spying law on foreign firms that operate there. They also say Yellen's visit is part of a push by President Joe Biden to stabilize the relationship between the world's two largest economies and minimize the risk of mistakes when disagreements arise. China's finance ministry on Monday confirmed Yellen's visit from July 6th to the 9th. It comes just weeks after Secretary of State Anthony Blinken visited Beijing and agreed with Chinese leader Xi Jinping to ensure the two countries' rivalry does not veer into conflict. Biden later referred to Xi as a dictator, resulting in loud protests from China, but analysts say the remark had little impact on efforts to improve ties. As the world's two largest economies, we have a responsibility to work together on global issues. According to the Treasury official who spoke on condition of anonymity, Yellen plans to tell Beijing that Washington will continue to defend human rights and its own national security interests through targeted actions against China, but wants to work together on urgent challenges like climate change and debt distress faced by many countries. The official declined to give details on which Chinese officials Yellen would meet. UK Health Secretary Steve Barclay has criticized junior doctors, accusing them of walking away from talks over pay and conditions. The British Medical Association, the union representing many from the profession, has called a five-day strike in July and is demanding a rise of 35% to restore their wages to 2008 levels. A familiar scene as a spring of strikes turns into a summer of disruption. While some health workers have settled, junior doctors in England are still in a bitter war of words with the government. They say their 35% pay request is an opening offer and accuse the health secretary of cancelling talks and negotiating in bad faith. If people uh, suspend the strikes, then we can get round the table, have talks. And the moment the junior doctors have walked away from the talks, we were in the middle of discussions with them. There were a range of other factors that they have raised with me in terms of uh, annual leave that is often cancelled at short notice, routers that have changed, some of the wellbeing issues. Developed it now. With the longest doctor strikes yet due this month, the head of NHS England, Amanda Pritchard, today warned patients were paying the price for the deadlock dispute. But in this tussle between medics and ministers, there may be a political cost to Rishi Sunak too. No ifs, no buts, no education cuts. With no teachers ifs. in England due to walk out later this month, one union boss apologised to parents for the disruption, but said pay rises were needed to keep staff in the profession. There'll also be disruption on the railways, as an overtime ban for drivers comes into force tomorrow and staff walk out altogether later this month. Disputes dragging on, Plenty of problems for the government, few simple solutions. Thousands rallied in Australia to back a campaign to recognise the country's indigenous people in the constitution ahead of a referendum later this year after a recent dip in support for the change. Australians spelling out the three-letter word that could change the country. We're all going to vote what? Yes. What? A message echoed from the East Coast yes. to the West as crowds gathered at more than 25 events calling for an Indigenous voice to Parliament to be enshrined in the Constitution using dance, music and smoke to send voters a signal. This is about moving Australia forward for everyone. The Yes campaign now moving forward with a different approach, shifting the focus from sports stars and celebrity endorsements to everyday Indigenous Australians. More than 70 organisations are sold on the message, with banks, sporting codes, insurance companies, trade unions, not-for-profits and major corporations joining forces to call for a Yes vote, and West Farmers, Rio Tinto and BHP each donating $2 million to the campaign. But the voice appears to be losing popularity with the public, with 43% voting yes in the latest news poll and 47% voting no. In a recent Resolve poll, support dropped below a majority, with no leading 51 to 49. Promising today's campaign relaunch is just the beginning. It is now where it belongs and uh, we will build on this between now and the referendum. 
The streets of Resistencia, the capital of the Argentine province of Chaco, were filled with hundreds of people marching to demand justice for Cecilia Sizowski, a 28-year-old woman who has been missing since June 1st and is presumed to have been murdered by her husband. Argentinians staged a demonstration on Sunday to demand justice in the case of a young woman who disappeared a month ago. Cecilia Straskowski went missing June 1st in a case that has gripped the nation. Her husband Cesar Sena and his parents, Amarenciano Sena and Marcela Acuna, were taken into custody and charged with murder after authorities found human remains on the Sena family property. Supporters with placards and pink balloons accompanied Straskowski's mother, Gloria Romero, on the march. Why wasn't it me? If they wanted a life, why not mine? I would have given it gladly for my daughter. My daughter was going to turn 29 in one month. She had more dreams than the amount of stars in the sky. Today, nothing is left. I found a strand of her hair today. Like all mothers, I kept everything. When she had her first hair cut, I made a little ball and kept it. Today, I took it out and I caressed my daughter's hair. An additional four people have also been arrested for possible involvement in the case. Welcome back. For more news, it's Take Around the World. The Dutch King William Alexander has apologized for Netherlands' historical involvement in slavery and the effects that it still has today. The King was speaking in Amsterdam on the 160th anniversary of the legal abolition of slavery in the Netherlands, including in former colonies in the Caribbean. Red Bull's Max Verstappen left the rest of the chasing pack in wake with another dominant victory at the Austrian Grand Prix. The Flying Dutchman hit the front early on and after retaking the lead from Charles Leclerc, he never looked back in finalizing a fifth straight win. Ferrari's Leclerc was second with Verstappen's teammate Sergio Perez third. Lewis Hamilton finished seventh. A European-built orbital satellite was launched to space from Florida on a mission to shed new light on the mysterious cosmic phenomena known as dark energy and dark matter. Unseen forces, scientists say, account for 95% of the known universe. Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko took part in wreath laying ceremony to mark country's Independence Day and the day Minsk was liberated from German occupation during World War II. A building under construction collapsed in an upscale neighborhood of Ivory Coast's economical hub, Abidjan, killing six people and injuring nine others. The building was an illegal construction coming up in Kokodi, home to several embassies and the presidential palace. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And tonight, we leave you with the views of Vancouver's Falls Creek Ferries putting on a ballet on water in celebration of Canada Day. Thank you for watching and have a great rest of your evening.